偷懒。哇！你那擦巴，你煮啊，你白火的呢？The Mao used to be Aborigines in north and central China, but over the last 3,000 years they've been forced to migrate southwards to avoid suppression and to preserve their own way of life. Today, they live in villages scattered over the mountains of southern China and Southeast Asia. There are 250,000 Mao, or Mung as they call themselves, now living in the Kingdom of Laos. In relation to their numbers, these hill tribesmen have suffered greater losses through war than any other group of people in Indochina. Eight years ago, a French anthropologist, Jacques Lemoine, came to this valley in northwest Laos to live with the Hmong. At that time, village after village was being drawn into the civil war. As I wanted to make uh, a sound study of the traditional Hmong society, I had to find a place where uh, nobody would be fighting at the time I was doing my study. And so I, I finally uh, chose this village because this village had no engagement in the war at all. Actually, uh, they had an experience in 1962 on the other side of the Mekong River, and uh, they just um, left the war behind them. Uh, they have been granted guns, American guns, to be part-time guerrilla themselves. But as soon as they saw how, what was the meaning of the war for them, they just gave back the guns and crossed the river and came here to settle in peace. My first difficulty was that they thought I came here to try to recruit them again. The first question they asked me was, what do you want our names for? You know, we don't want to get involved in anything. It took me a year and a half to get the first spontaneous smile of greeting from them. Jacques Lemoine's closest friend in the village is Chu Yao, one of the village elders and the valley's most successful shaman. The shaman is the man who cures both illness and disturbed minds. On this occasion, he's trying to placate the evil spirits which are giving Senkal, his son, bad dreams. Senkal dreamt that the river rose, flooded, and drowned his children. Chuyo is calling his troop of auxiliary spirits to assemble at his altar to help drive away the nightmares.
Priya has prepared an arch of magic paper to brush away the dreams which cling to his son, and a ladder of swords to cut off the pursuit of the evil spirits. When a disease is not attributed to the spirits, the monks seek the aid of drugs, western or traditional. One of the traditional drugs is opium. It's not only a medicine for the monk, they smoke it for pleasure. It's also an important way of making money with the lowlanders. Once a week, about, Tuya refines a small amount of raw opium for the household's consumption and for entertaining friends. With the first rains of the wet season, work in the fields begins. In the hills, land is no problem. Every year, the Mayo burn off different areas of forest to make new fields. The old slopes are left to regenerate themselves. This type of hill farming is called slash and burn agriculture. Mbla, Chu Yao's elder wife, calls for the wind to help burn the last few piles of brushwood. <coughs> now, after the rains, Nzo, his younger wife, begins planting maize. A man can have more than one wife and the woman always goes to live in her father-in-law's house. The ideal is to form a large extended family living under one roof. The more hands there are, the larger the area of land they can cultivate.
There is no single authority in the village and all important decisions are taken together by the elders. But Chuya's judgment is highly respected and it's to his house that a visitor has come to discuss the current village crisis, the threatened recruitment of their young men into the Royal Lao Army. The visitor's two sons were forcibly enlisted three weeks ago. Did you manage to get your two sons released? I went up to Luang Prabang to the military camp there. For 10 days I struggled with the army to let my sons go free. They refused. The country is troubled and rotten. Now there are government soldiers and Pathet Lao soldiers everywhere. These Mao live in one of the last mountain areas which have not been ravaged by the civil war. But because the fighting has intensified, it's becoming ever more difficult for them to live in peace. Further to the north, 200 families have just been moved by the leftists, the Pathet Lao. Chu Yao says, When you were up there, did you see them taking men away to be soldiers? Sao Li replies, Of course they draft the men. They don't worry about the 50-year-olds, but they take the 40-year-olds immediately. <laughs> In the past, the villagers have been able to avert threats to their own neutrality. The elders have shown great diplomacy in making soldiers from both sides aware that they are not welcome in the valley. Now, for the first time, they face the menace of conscription. In the present emergency, Chu Yao toys with the idea of telling the Royal Lao authorities that all his men are opium addicts and unable to fight. If the demands for their men persist, how much longer can these villagers avoid being caught up in the war? Chu Yao continues his role as shaman. He's been asked to exorcise the evil influence which has been haunting the house of Nduap Pao. Two years ago, he killed his brother whilst hunting, mistaking him for a bear. Chu Yao is calling the souls. Each person has many souls. The most important being the growing bamboo, the running bull, the reindeer, the shadow and iron souls. The departure of any one of these 
can bring disease or death. When he sings, the souls have arrived. He casts his magic net of iron and checks with the buffalo horns that they have been caught. Chu Yao asked his spirit troops to herd together all the running bull and bring the souls of the family, including those of the dead man's widow and his killer. He builds a magic coral around them by borrowing the living soul of a sacrificed pig. He blows water for his spirits to wash away the dust and darkness, disease and death from the shadow and iron souls of the family. The soul of the pig will be released at the end of the year and Chu Ya provides it with pepper spirit money for its expenses. <laughs> The imprint of the pig's blood is a sign to the spirits that the people are under the protection of the pig's soul. Another pig will be sacrificed to shelter the killer under an umbrella of iron and copper. Now, it's time for Chu Yao to mount his horse of cloud and wind, to ride between sky and earth along the paths to the other world. He gives the final instruction to his assistants before his departure. All the men thank the master and bid him farewell. off, he summons his troops to follow, calling every spirit by name. Then he leads the charge against the evil spirit. They 
will be taken away by a sacrificed goat awaiting them at the doorway. With his large shamanic sword, he cuts the evil spirits to pieces. stampede behind the goal and an assistant speeds them on their way. By now, the danger of conscription has become a major issue throughout the valley. An envoy from another village tells Chuya the feelings of his clansmen. I asked old Njua what he would think if the royal army took his sons away to be soldiers. He said that if he knew his sons were going to be drafted, they'd all leave the country immediately. It seems in our village there are seven boys who are eligible to be drafted, amongst them Chao, my son. I must go and find out tomorrow. <laughs> I don't know what Sao Pao's people are going to do, but as far as we're concerned, it seems best that I go down to see the provincial governor. There's a chance we can persuade him to supply us with papers to exempt us from the army. While Chu Yao was away, the villagers were planting rice together. But in view of the mounting uncertainty, some of them were wondering whether it was worth the effort. Would they still be in their valley for the harvest? The delicate balance which villagers like Chu Ya must maintain between rival claims to their allegiance was made all the more obvious on his return. <laughs> Can you tell us roughly what, what Chu Ya is, is talking about? Well, <clears throat> we heard just right now that uh, on the very morning, ni 90 uh, Vietnamese soldiers came uh, to the village down the river. But the, he said that they will not move on their time and they will wait until uh, sunset to send some messengers here to visit him. What chance, Jacques, do you think that the Hmong in this valley now have of remaining at peace? It depends on their ability to cope with either the rightist soldiers who want them to be uh, uh, regular soldiers of the Laotian army, 
a thing that they think they can't afford because they won't be able to defend themselves against the Vietnamese. And the last ev event seems to seems to, to tell the same thing because when you have 90 Vietnamese soldiers, well-trained Vietnamese soldiers in your valley, I don't see how poor villagers could fight them. So if they can handle the situation, it means to comply with Vietnamese uh, needs for a short time and have them go away from their valley, they might stay at peace. If, for instance, uh, the Lao Royal Army will know about it, they will send at once T-28 to bomb the area. Pilots on this bombing mission over northern Laos were Mayo. There are 30 Mayo pilots flying T-28 bombers over territory which was once their homeland. And you are a male pilot? Yeah, I am. Who are the enemy? What nationality? Uh, I don't know. Maybe the... North Vietnamese. Enemy Vietnam or the Laos. What are the main targets which you go to bomb? I don't know, sir. Maybe I follow leader only. <laughs> follow the leader? Yeah. But you must know what you are bombing, no? Yeah? I must know uh, they are enemy, and we go to bomb enemy, but I don't know. But do you know who the enemy are? I think maybe uh, North Vietnam. John Everingham is the only Western journalist to have been captured by the Pathet Lao. We asked him what happened when the Pathet Lao entered a traditional Mayo village. Well, before the Pathet Lao or North Vietnamese actually get to arrive in these villages, the people have always left their village. They have two choices, either to stay in the region and go and live in the forest with the Pathet Lao, or to leave the region and go into uh, American-supported American refugee camps. Um, why did they go into the forest? 
Why? Well, because uh, the Americans are fighting this war with uh, air power, and uh, uh, there is a line, a line of bombing. As the Pathet Lao come down, the bombing follow, follows them, and uh, the people, as soon as, as soon as they hear the bombing coming within a few miles of their village, uh, they flee into the forest. Uh, in the Pathet Lao region, it's even very difficult to make their fields. Every time I was out in the open, every time I saw people out in the open, as soon as a plane came, they had to run for cover. And so if you're out in the field and a plane came, which is very, very often, there are planes continu almost continuously overhead, uh, the people just had to, stay on, had to stay under cover. They couldn't go out and uh, build villages, cut trees, uh, fix their fields. They couldn't, uh, the, the, the traditional way of life is just quite impossible. Around here, there is even more, far, far more intensive bombing. It's one of the most heavily bombed regions of uh, Indochina. A large and high block of mountains there that once, as I say, uh, supported large, well, many, many, many thousands of male there. And most of those male now are either living underground and under the forest, or else they have come down and they are living in the areas which are American controlled and are not being bombed. There's maybe 150,000 of them living in these regions, I believe. The Mao live in the highlands of Indochina, and these highlands have seen continuous fighting for the last 30 years. In the Civil War in Laos, the mountainous region in the north has been the battleground between the American-backed Royal Lao forces, principally the Mao, and the Pathet Lao with their North Vietnamese allies. Today, the Pathet Lao control most of the highland areas, and those Mao who have opposed the Pathet Lao and North Vietnamese have been forced to leave their homelands and flee further and further south. Now, over 100,000 Mao refugees are crowded into camps in the last highland areas before the plains of Vientiane. Five thousand Mao live in the refugee camp at Phu Pai Mai. Most of the refugees have spent the last ten years moving from camp to camp as the war has rolled backwards and forwards over their mountains. For some, this will be their fifteenth home in ten years. The men here are either casualties of the war or soldiers on leave. Of the women, fifty percent are war widows. And by the age of 14, all the boys have left Pupai Mai to go and fight. Four four seven, four four seven. Are you dropping rice or corn leaf? Over. You don't see many animals in Pupai Mai. They had to be left behind in the moves. There isn't enough land for the people to farm. But some keep seeds in anticipation of the day when they can return to their ancestral villages in the north. When the battlefront moved southward earlier this year, Nguyen Zai and his fellow villagers became refugees. No! Yeah! 
We had to leave our village because Pathet Lao and North Vietnamese soldiers came very close. And there was fighting between them and Royal Lao soldiers. Bombs exploded in our fields and shells fell on our houses. The war has brought us nothing but misery. My only wish is that the fighting should stop in our troubled land so that we can all return to our villages. We just want to begin our peaceful lives again, like they were before the fighting, when we could grow our rice and look after our animals. We've had to move home ten times because of the fighting. We moved from Nong Het to Pu Nong, from Pu Nong to Latwa, Latwa to Pa Dong, Pa Dong to Pa Kao, Pa Kao to Tia Siong, Tia Siong to Pu Pai Mai. We've lost everything. We could bring nothing with us. Everything you see here has been given to us. Tai Va was wounded in 1960. <laughs> Nang Chu became a refugee in 1963. He's lost his five brothers in the fighting, and his two wives died of malnutrition as they fled southwards through the mountains. I was born in Siang Kuang. I had to leave there many years ago. My parents are buried there, and it's in Siang Kuang that I want to die.
Kupai Mai is in Military Region 2 under the control of Mao leader General Vang Pao. Twelve years ago, he was chosen by the Americans to assemble a Mao guerrilla army. This army of hill tribesmen has taken the brunt of the fighting in the Civil War. We asked him what was the reason for the war. Uh, the general is saying that uh, we have a uh, territorial uh, bound, boundary and also our independence just like your country. And uh, when another country is, tra is uh, trying to invade your country, this is the uh, responsibility of all our people to fight and hold, your in hold our independence and uh, our territorial boundary. We then asked General Vang Pao how much longer he thought the Mayo could go on fighting since they'd already lost half their men. This is, uh, according to General Vang Pao, this is uh, not important, and, uh, the question of for how long. When somebody is trying to, uh, uh, to chase you out from your land or to invade your country, even when you, it's, your, it's necessary for you to fight to the last man, During the major offensive earlier this year, General Vang Pao moved 3,000 Mayo refugees down to these barracks in Vientiane. There were no more hills for them to go to. Uh, he hopes that uh, peace will come to our country one day and then from then on we can rebuild our economy and our uh, nation. Uh, it's, it's not that we have to depend only on uh, foreign to, uh, okay, so foreigners to... Uh, because I must go and... Yeah, minutes is home now, yeah. We don't have to depend yeah. on foreigners to, uh, to be able to survive because we have uh, been survived for more than 2,000 years without help. Rise up, old souls. Rise up and come back. Mothers and daughters, sons and grandsons, young and old, rise up and come back. Whether you fell on earth or fell in water, rise up and come back. Even if you have changed into wandering ghosts, rise up and come back to find a house, to find parents, to find a bed. Ban Son was once a peaceful village in the hills 70 miles north of Vientiane. But two years ago, Site 272, as it's now called, became the new center of operations for the war. At 7.30 every morning, the Americans arrived, commuting from Vientiane.
900 flights a day land here. Most bring war supplies and fresh troops for General Wang Pao's army. Others bring food for the Mayo refugees. For the Mayo, Ban Son is a crossroads. The refugees wait here in the hope of a lift back to their villages. From here, the soldiers are flown to their mountain outposts, and the dead are brought from the battlefront back to their families. My little brother, what can I do? I will never be able to forget you. Where are you, my little brother, my little orphan? Ah, my little brother, if only I had foreseen your death, I would never have allowed you to go away. I would have forced you to stay with me always. You are dead, my little brother. How will I ever be able to forget you? Ah, my little brother, why were you not born a girl? Then you could not have gone away to war. You would have stayed with me and you would not now be dead. Ah, my little brother, there were many soldiers in your band, but luck was not with you. My little brother, little orphan, we cannot stay brothers together forever. My poor little brother could not remain with me all of my life. You are dead. Your body decays and melts forever into the earth. The country is troubled and rotten. Even if we could not have made a living together, we could have lived on distant mountains and received news of each other. Now I am alone like an orphan. We were poor. There was no way for us to make our living. We have no land anymore. I am left an orphan on this painful earth. I have no younger brother to come and help me when I am in need. Our soldiers are only a barrier. We are a fence to protect people of other races. Fighting has overrun the country. We have no homes left, and my little brother is dead. He is no longer with me. We have entered the way of misery. Oh. 